All right, that's two minutes. So I'm going to get cracking. Uh, welcome everybody to this, the seventh, I think, CNCF webinar. Could be sixth, could be seventh, I didn't count. Uh, today we've got John Balamaric, who's going to be giving us an introduction to Core DNS. Um, in case you haven't been in one of these webinars before, um, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation, um, but you are not able to speak, so please put your questions into either the Q&A or the chat box down at the bottom. I will find opportune moments to interrupt John and ask him those questions. Uh, I see that it's filling up now, so I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. John, are you ready? Yes, I am. Excellent. Take it away. Okay, great. Well, hello, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for attending today. Um, I'm John Bellamerick. Uh, I'm a maintainer of Core DNS. I work for Infoblox, um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you today. Uh, about Core DNS, uh, give an introduction as to what it is and some of the interesting, more unique features, as well as then uh, go into a demo of bringing Core DNS up in a, um, a, a as the in cluster DNS in a in a Kubernetes cluster. So to start that, what is Core DNS? Core DNS is a, a cloud native authoritative DNS server. Uh, it's essentially the successor to Sky DNS two for dynamic DNS-based service discovery. Um, it's, it's intended to be a better SkyDNS than SkyDNS. Uh, in fact, it's, it was started uh, by the same author of SkyDNS, which is Meet Gibbon from Google. Uh, he also still leads the project, and um, we have a number of people from Infoblox as well as other people in the community involved as well. Uh, the really key thing about CoreDNS is this, uh, as, an ex as an extensible middleware, very flexible, uh, request pipeline. So it becomes very easy to add additional functionality to it. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. We are an inception project with the CNCF. We joined in, uh, in March and um, we've been, you know, really grateful to the CNCF for giving us opportunities like this to talk to you as well as uh, time at conferences as well and access to, um, to some CI resources. And in fact, uh, Linux foundation, which of which CNCF is a part, uh, redesigned our logo for us uh, and uh, is helping us with the work on our website. So we're, we're really happy with our, uh, our uh, sponsorship by CNCF and uh, want to see that continue. So why did, uh, why did Meet create and why do we um, support Core DNS uh, in, in this community? Um, as I said, it's really intended to be a, a better Sky DNS, DNS than Sky DNS. Sky DNS started as something to allow this dynamic service discovery backed by etcd, but that's really still a very narrow narrow use case. And what we wanted to do was uh, create a DNS server that could be used for ordinary DNS as well as for service discovery, and would um, allow us to back it by different things and have different kinds of of uh, manipulations of the request as it goes through. So it's designed from the start actually based upon the Caddy web server. We use some of their libraries internally um, that and that that web server that sir is really now more of a generic server infrastructure and it, it allows the creation of these middleware and the configuration of these middleware. Um, so this has enabled us to create a lot of unique features that um, that would have been more difficult to add to something like SkyDNS. Um, in particular, we've added functionality where we can uh, encrypt DNS over TLS, which is pretty standard, but then we've also, out of our own invention, have integrated with gRPC, so we can uh, actually essentially tunnel DNS through gRPC over a TLS connection, which is more secure. Um, we are working on integrating it with some external uh, policy servers, uh, and of course, uh, we'll talk more about later here as we uh, have integrated directly with Kubernetes um, to be the in-cluster DNS. So essentially here, what we're doing is showing how you can use the, the traditional um, mechanism we used in Sky DNS with etcd, or you can alternately uh, directly talk to the Kubernetes API. And in fact, you can do this both at the same time for different zones and, and sort of make uh, a more flexible um, uh, configuration that way. Uh, in addition to the, the, the use in cloud native stacks, it is a full-fledged 
uh, authoritative DNS server that supports all kinds of other traditional DNS use cases. So I mentioned the architecture and how that's really one of the key features of Core DNS. This is uh, a diagram showing how the requests are processed when they come into uh, Core DNS. So this, the essential, um, you know, the essential insight here is to have all of the features contained within these independent middleware. So the middleware can be chained in different ways for different zones. Um, in this example here, which comes out of one of our blogs, you can see the um, a DNS query coming in on the standard port will go to do two different processing pipelines or three different processing pipelines based upon whether it's example.io, example.net, or anything else. And we can pass uh, these different, different requests through these different middleware to resolve them differently. Um, in the case of example.io, we'll, we'll pull it from a file, but we'll log it. Example.net, we don't bother logging it. And for everything else, we actually run it through Kubernetes because maybe this is in cluster and we wanna, we wanna see that uh, resolve the in-cluster DNS names. So what are some of these middleware that we're talking about? Um, like I said, there's, there's two different essentially categories of, of middleware. There's what we call request manipulators and backends. Backends um, enable you to source data from different types of uh, repositories. So the most typical one, of course, file, ordinary zone file, uh, same as you would have used with bind uh, or could still use with bind. Um, we have another one, auto, which works really well in a combination with Git sync, where essentially you have a directory that we monitor and whenever you, uh, you know, you make a DNS record change, you can commit it to, to GitHub and Git sync will automatically pull it down, populate that directory and we'll begin serving that DNS. Um, so these are some of the kinds of backends, of course, the etcd and Kubernetes and, and a number of other ones as they, uh, as, as needed by the community. On the request manipulation side, this is where things get really interesting. Um, you know, we've got a lot of standard DNS features, things like caching, both positive and negative caching. Uh, we support DNSSEC, um, but we've also built in some functionality that's really geared for uh, cloud native environments. So uh, distributed tracing, which uh, enables us to trace, when we have all this, th these different kinds of middleware, um, the DNS processing can become a little more complicated. So this allows us to actually trace the DNS requests throughout our uh, um, set of applications. And uh, you'll see one in a slide later where we, where we make use of this. Um, the, the integration with Prometheus for running in a Kubernetes environment or other cloud native environment, we have, we have that, uh, the health check. And um, you know, the, the, some of this proxying um, which allows us to serve uh, serve data from different different zones and then send uh, unknown things out to a different different server. I mentioned external policy engines. So this is a, a use case where we take advantage of all this middleware. This is an Infoblox SaaS offering, and uh, today the way we do this is. Um, we have a specialized unbound server. What, what the, the functionality is, is essentially blocking queries that are say command and control domains for uh, botnets or something. So uh, a customer in a branch office on-prem makes a DNS request that goes out to our cloud where we determine whether or not it's uh, a bad domain. If it's a bad domain, we refuse or redirect. Now, if it's a good domain, we simply resolve it. Today's solution, we're, 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 we've been investing in Core DNS partly because we want to, we want partly because we want to do it in this in this uh, SaaS offering, and um, so we're looking over the next couple months to to roll that out using DNS Core DNS. But here's where we we use some of these really interesting middleware. Um, the in the current system, we use Unbound with something called Response Policy Zones, which are are great but are very take a lot of memory. And whenever any of these policies change, which can happen every few minutes, it requires Unbound to reload uh, all of those response policy zones, which may take a minute or two. 
So instead, we're going to scrap all that. We take uh, an open source policy engine called Themis that, that we're building, but you can also use something like Open Policy Agent, which is another open source policy engine. Um, but we, we have Core DNS on-prem. It talks uh, to the client. The client talks to it using ordinary DNS. And then it takes that, wraps it up in TLS using our gRPC proxy, sends that up to a Core DNS in the cloud. Um, Actually, I skipped a step there. The on-prem also appends certain data to the request uh, that identifies the site and the customer. And then the cloud core DNS knows how to unpack the gRPC request. It extracts that extra data that was appended, sends it along with the query name and the uh, source IP, things like that, to the policy engine, which can then make the decisions. Uh, and that point core DNS Policy middleware will decide whether or not to pass this on upstream to the recursive resolver or to deny or refuse or, or redirect the request. So by doing this with Core DNS, what we've done is we've um, eliminated the need to reload. Uh, we've, we've enabled us to use a stock unbound instead of a specialized one that supports RPZ. And um, we allow more arbitrary policies that can be implemented in this external policy engine uh, in a way that, that we couldn't do before. Uh, another, of course, place where we use uh, Core DNS is Kubernetes, and that's actually mostly what I want to talk about today. Um, Core DNS, we've spent um, the last uh, few months building out the Kubernetes integration, the Kubernetes middleware, so that it can be a drop-in replacement for the existing cube DNS. So why would we do that? Well, we see a number of issues with the existing cube DNS. One is uh, the lack of flexibility. Uh, it's more difficult to, um, you, you don't have access to all these same DNS features that are already there in core DNS uh, because kube DNS is sort of specialized for, uh, it's specialized only for Kubernetes. Um, core DNS also, has a lot of the things built in that kubeDNS today needs to run extra sidecar processes for. So um, we have a single process, single executable that runs, that handles health, that handles caching, that handles the Kubernetes integration. So there's, there's not um, three different pieces running all at the same time, which is what you have in, in kubeDNS. We also saw some issues in, in kubeDNS, some, some things that it did um, that weren't ideal. So for example, uh, one of the issues is that, that pod IP lookups are uh, simply an echo back of whatever you send, um, which uh, the intent of that feature, pod IP lookups, is for wildcard certificates. But by echoing back anything that they send, you're kind of breaking the, the trust of the, the, the certificate, the purpose of val validating identity. I'll, I'll show that a little bit later. And we've made it a lot easier with those existing features um, that, that exist within Core DNS to do customized uh, DNS entries within, uh, within your Kubernetes environment. Uh, also in Kubernetes, um, actually not done by our, our uh, core team here, it's actually done by, 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 by which I mean the uh, Meek and me and a few other people that are the core team on Core DNS, um, but actually done by another uh, set of open source developers who are really at this point users of, of um, Core DNS. It's, it's not so much a, a change to Core DNS, but it is a use of Core DNS, is uh, we're a, the only really on-prem alternative for a federated DNS provider within the Core DNS, uh, within the Kubernetes Federation. So in Kubernetes Federation, there's a, the control plane will configure DNS entries to help the different clusters find uh, each other, essentially. And um, today, uh, that's generally done with cloud um, DNS providers like uh, Route 53 or Google, Cl Google Cloud DNS, or I think Azure was just recently added. Uh, but for on-prem DNS uh, services where you're not using a cloud service, um, you'll use Core DNS as that provider. So this is a, actually a completely distinct use of Core DNS within the Kubernetes ecosystem that's uh, it's not in cluster DNS. It's, it's completely different. Um, we have also heard from some companies about uh, the need for 
doing federated DNS, meaning multi-cluster DNS, um, without necessarily running the federation control plane. And so we're looking at solutions and we have a, a proposal um, that we're reviewing with the community on how to um, do federated DNS with or without the control plane by using core DNS instances in each cluster that communicate with one another. So that's something we're looking at. Um, I wanna drill more into the Kubernetes piece. So um, I'm gonna actually show a demo here. What we have here is uh, I've got a mini cube that I started up uh, on my laptop. It's running the standard cube DNS here. And I just wanna show how it works, how you replace the standard cube DNS with core DNS. So we have a GitHub repository uh, in our core DNS organization called deployment. And it's got, um, it's got some directories saying, okay, here's how you deploy system D, uh, core DNS in system D, here's how you deploy it, deploy it in Kubernetes. And so what we've done is tried to make it as easy as possible by creating um, some scripts to help set up the configuration. Um, so what we do is we run this deploy script. It will generate a, uh, a complete deployment for core DNS, the, um, the service, the deployment, uh, a config map. And um, I'll show you that now. What we give it is the, the service CIDR. That's so that we can do reverse lookups on services and our cluster domain and the base file to use. In, in Kubernetes 1.6, we have role-based access control. And so uh, we need to have a little bit different file than we had previously for older versions of Kubernetes. Um, okay, all that does is spit out this file here. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. So within, in order to get CoreDNS running in cluster, it needs access to certain resources in the cluster via the, the Kubernetes API. So we need to set up a service account. This is the role-based access control I was talking about that has access to, um, to those resources. So that's what the, the first few resources do. Then we set up a config map, which represents the, um, the configuration of, of CoreDNS. So in this config map, we're, we're gonna catch, catch errors and log them. We're going to log ordinary queries. We want to support the Kubernetes uh, health checks. And um, we're going to use the Kubernetes middleware to handle cluster.local domain. And we're gonna do reverse lookups on this. Everything else is just set to the default uh, of the Kubernetes middleware uh, in this particular um, example. Anything that doesn't match cluster.local will pass through here to this proxy middleware, which will use the, um, the name servers configured in the core DNS pods Etsy resolve.conf in order to, um, to do the uh, upstream lookups. And we're gonna cache things for 30 seconds. So this essentially more or less duplicates the standard uh, cube DNS functionality. You could also enable the Prometheus. Um, that's not enabled in this one, but if you're running that, you can enable that as well. One thing we do that, that in this particular deployment file, of course you can customize these and do whatever you want with them. And we'll do that actually for our demo. But one thing we do is the, the assumption that, that this particular script makes is that um, you're replacing a, uh, an existing cube DNS. So the script actually looks up the cube DNS cluster IP and sticks it in here and keeps the service name cube DNS. And the reason we do that is that when we apply this manifest, um, if we keep the cube DNS service name and cluster IP, then there's no loss of DNS service while the transition is happening from core DNS to cube DNS. In our example here, I do wanna show some features that aren't enabled by default. So I do have a 
custom YAML that basically took that file that was generated and then added some customizations. So I'll talk a little bit about what each of those are. The um, one example, one thing I want to show is how the um, how we can use what's essentially functionally equivalent to what's called a stub domain. So if you've got your your cluster um, running uh, and you want to be able to have your services access certain things within an internal domain and you, you want everything else that isn't within the cluster to get resolved, say, by some public DNS server, then this sort of conditional forwarding um, uh, can be done in the, in the latest version of KubeDNS. I believe they can do it too, um, but we offer somewhat more flexible um, configuration of that. So you, you have, uh, we specify here a separate domain, internal.coreDNS.io, and I say that let's proxy that through this particular DNS server, whereas um, everything else is going to get proxied through whatever that is in the Etsy resolve.conf. Additionally, I'm going to serve up example.org directly from this core DNS, and I've got a, a file here in my, my config map that shows example.org. And um, and that's, oh, and I know this This here shows uh, we want to be able to look up the pod IPs, reverse, reverse lookup on pod IPs. And I'm going to show you a feature called pods verified, which I mentioned earlier regarding the, um, the wildcard certificates and the way DNS works for that. And uh, lastly here, I will show you um, how the rewrite works so that you can use the same certificate, for example, with uh, the same domain name for your services that are running inside the cluster and for external clients and still get your certificates validated properly. So um, this is running Minikube, as I said. One of the things about Minikube that's a little bit odd, and actually this is uh, on GKE too, is that it runs, it has something called an add-on manager. And the add-on manager will actually uh, undo the changes we make to certain services. So I'm just going to turn off um, the the oops, Cube DN, DNS add-ons. Otherwise, when we replace the Cube DNS service with our own configuration, um, uh, the add-on manager will come along later and, and undo our changes. So now I'm going to I'm going to apply our custom core DNS. So that creates everything there. And like it, like I, you see, I use, I'm still reusing the same service name. And it's, it looks like it's running. Okay, we have a core DNS running and the previous cube DNS is terminating because I turned off the add-on. Um, in addition to, uh, running the Cordianus here just so I can show a, a comparison. I'm going to uh, run a few other um, a few other things within this, this service. So I'm going to run the original um, cube DNS, but, uh, but not using that, that service name. Um, I am going to run a, um, I, an internal DNS server to show how it works with, with the internal. So this is actually a separate instance of Core DNS that that internal domain will get will get that will be used to resolve that internal domain. Um, and I am going to run a fake service, which will which will be used in our rewrite. All right. So. Let's take a look, we'll, we'll watch the log of Core DNS. And um, I'm gonna run a little utility here that just runs a pod that's got a, uh, it's an Alpine based pod with some basic DNS utilities, curl and things like that, as well as curl and things like that installed. So I use this to kind of kind of show the testing. So, um, 
I guess the first and easiest thing to show is that, uh, in fact, you know, it does work. <laughs> it does resolve cluster IPs. This is our log for core DNS. And we can see we've resolved that, that cluster IP. Um, the other thing though is let's look at some of the more advanced use cases. So we talked about the conditional forwarding. So let's run a, um, let's, let's monitor the log of um, the internal DNS server. So this is the, the instance of core DNS that I ran to simulate some internal DNS server within your organization. Oops. Oh, maybe I ran it in the default. So this is saying, Core DNS is running, it's listening for this zone on port 53. So let's try and resolve something um, from that zone, like and that's so, so we, we see that it gets it gets the request rather um, well, here's an interesting thing. So the way Kubernetes works, uh, each pod that gets launched has um, in its resolve.com. So if you're familiar with the way DNS works, there's something called a search path or, um, or a search list. And essentially, when you send in a request that's got fewer than a certain number of dots, it will go through that search path. So what, what happens, and this is just standard DNS uh, resolvers, the way they work. So you can see that what, what actually gets requested is this. Um, set of, of uh, th this name, which it, it has cluster.local. So initially the Kubernetes middleware will pick that up and it'll say, oh, well, that's not a valid service name anywhere. So I'm just gonna return it. And then the, it sort of iterates through this, this search path. And this is a standard Kubernetes, standard Kubernetes behavior. Finally, it gets to, um, it gets to the last one, which is internal.cordians.io which returns the no error because it actually went through the proxy and talked to this one and looked it up. Now, if we try a different uh, cordians.io, which isn't part of internal, then we're not gonna hit that, that um, stub domain and instead it's gonna go out uh, to the internet and resolve it. So that's what's happened there. One other thing we, we showed, maybe, maybe I should show the file again. We, we talked about the rewrite and essentially what this does is is whenever a, a, a query comes in for this specific domain, um, it's going to to change the name internally in within Core DNS for the next for the rest of the middleware chain. It's going to change it to this. So the idea here and why you might want to use this um, in a Kubernetes environment is if you have uh, some service that's running um, TLS and uh, externally that's known as um, www.cordians.io. Um, that certificate that's being served up is signed from that domain name, uh, for that domain name, www.cordians.io. So things that are outside your cluster can use that name and they can resolve it and, and the handshake works. Things inside your cluster, they can use that name, but it would actually hairpin out. So it's, assuming you're running that service in your cluster, it's gonna hairpin out and go back through the, through the outside world, which you know, isn't very efficient. So rather than doing that, it would be nice to be able to um, just use the internal service name. The problem is that if you use the internal service name, the certificate 
isn't signed with that name, and so you're going to get a, a host name mismatch, and you're going to your your handshake's going to your TLS handshake's going to fail. So we can kind of trick the resolver here by taking in that cordiness.io, that initial same as external name, and just switching it internally to a different one. So when I run this, what we should see is the, the internal address come back, which is what this is, 10.0.34. If we were to run Oh, and put it in. There it is. So we're returning the internal internal uh, address. So that enables you to use the same certificate and use the same name, um, both for internal and external clients. Okay. One other thing that I wanted to show was the um, the pods verified feature. So one interesting thing in uh, in the way kubeDNS works today is that if I, I, I've got my kubeDNS running at a different address. So if I, if I run if I look this up in kubeDNS, which is running on dot 20, I get a response. It says it's got address one, two, three, four. I can put anything I want here. And this feature was put in to make wildcard certificates work, but actually it makes them work, but it makes them work by kind of uh, invalidating the guarantee of identity. And so you actually, um, it wouldn't be easy, but it would it does open up a possibility to, uh, for somebody in a separate namespace to um, hijack uh, that certificate, essentially make, make it look like um, you're talking to the service you intend to talk to in a particular namespace, but actually you're talking to a service in a different namespace. So in order to avoid that and work around that, that security issue, we introduced this concept of pods verified. And what pods verified will do is actually we'll listen to the pods from the Kubernetes API, not just the services and endpoints. Typically, kubedns and cordns in its default configuration only listen for services and endpoints. They don't really, you, you don't want to load the pods in because it does use some extra memory. But uh, if you're using these wildcard certificates and using this feature, it's definitely more secure if you take advantage of this. So what we do is now with this request, it will be made to um, CoreDNS instead of KubeDNS. And you can see we get NX domain. Whereas if I look at what my IP address of this pod is, let's give that a try. Okay, it resolves properly. So essentially what we're doing is um, keeping the same DNS schema, the way kubeDNS works with these pod addresses, but we're validating that when you request uh, a pod for a, a pod IP address for a particular uh, namespace, that there actually is a pod running in that namespace. So if I were to change this to a different namespace, it will fail. So that's really it for the demo. I don't know if there are any questions before I talk a little bit about our uh, our future and how to get a hold of us. Yeah, we got some. Uh, we got a few questions. And um, <clears throat> Justin asks, uh, what are the recommended ratios for scaling core DNS versus number of pods slash nodes? Uh, that's a great question. So right now we are still, uh, you know, it's going to depend on some of the features you have enabled in there, but we we're actually still evaluating that. So one of the things we get with 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 uh, CNCF is access to a cluster and um, a bare metal cloud actually. And so what we're working on now is both automated and manual uh, evaluations of questions like that. So we're going to take that um, bare metal cloud, we're gonna build out different Kubernetes environments of different sizes and monitor and measure the different um, you know, uh, memory usage with some of the different features on and off. Like I said, pods verified increases the, the memory usage. But we need to know. We need to really characterize exactly how much. And I don't have that data yet, but we're working on it. 
Uh, thanks, John. And Justin, if that didn't answer the question, then uh, do feel free to type back in the chat again. Uh, Justin asked a second question, which is, is there a recommended setup to use CoreDNS external from Kubernetes that can also look up Kubernetes services? Would that require federation or just separate instances both backed by Kubernetes? So if I understand the question, right, if you want to run CoreDNS outside of the cluster, but have it look up cluster services, so you could actually, uh, the, the issue is that the, the cluster, uh, the, the services that get, that, that get, the IP addresses that get returned are usually the cluster IPs. Um, but if you have routable pod IPs, for example, you're using um, uh, a VLAN or something that's routable for your pod cider, and you could use the SRV records. So SRV records are headless services work a little differently rather than returning the cluster IP, which is the Kubernetes internal load balancer VIP. Um, the, the SRV records would return the uh, actual pod IPs. So if you have routable pods and you're using headless services, um, then you certainly could either run your CoreDNS in cluster like we shown, like I've shown here, and just give it a, a, a node port or a load balancer uh, type of service. Or you can run CoreDNS external to Kubernetes, uh, and you simply have to, in your configuration, you have to give uh, the Kubernetes API endpoint um, and, uh, and other um, connectivity and credentials and things like that. But um, it, it is designed to be able to be done externally. It's just that. Um, most often we do run it in cluster. Thanks, John. And uh, one more also from Justin. He says, with rewrites, how does that work when some services are internal to Kubernetes and some are external? Does it fail back to proxy, to proxy the request? So, so rewrite, yes, you could rewrite um, to a non-internal name and it would proxy the request out, yes. Great, thanks. Uh, and if Justin, if that was not the question, uh, we're going to carry on now, but feel free to ask again and we'll come back to it at the end. Thanks, John. Any other questions? Or? Uh, that's it for now. Okay, one, one thing I was going to mention, uh, we also have an experimental feature that's a little bit re related to this. One of the things you see, one of the issues people see with kubedns, you know, I talked a little bit about that search search path. Well, when you query for something outside the cluster, like you query for google.com, I mean, we can actually, we can see, you'll see that you get, you know, you get a bunch of, of, of queries. So this is a sort of amplification of the queries that are hitting, uh, hitting the server. So this is the client going back, going back, going back, going back till finally it resolves to something. And we have an experimental feature that has some bizarre edge cases, but might be useful for people in some, in some cases. We will actually take this first query and we'll recognize that it's coming from a particular IP address, a particular pod, and therefore a particular namespace. And so we'll recognize that this trailing piece is, is one of these search path queries, and we'll just resolve this directly and just return you the result. So it, it reduces the number of queries that the client has to do over and over it reduces the latency as well as reduces the load on the overall DNS server. But that is experimental. There's some edge cases where things go a little bit weird, um, which probably don't apply in most people for most people's systems, but you know, we we're running an experimental for that reason. All right. Um, so a little bit about our future plans. Um, one is uh, we want to do some things on really the basic DNS functionality, not as, as um, not particularly the Kubernetes one. We have Kubernetes things planned too, but some of the basic things are uh, zero touch DNSSEC. So if you've used something like Caddy that that, you, that integrates with um, with uh, certificate management services like Let's Encrypt, essentially it, it automatically sets up your TLS for a website or web server. We want to do the same thing for DNS. We want to be able to uh, have zero touch DNSSEC set up. Um, we're working on DNS tap support. DNS tap is a, um, a, a sort of passive capture of the DNS queries that are going through for, for various analysis. And we have actually, uh, thanks to the CNCF again, we have a Google Summer of Code student who's uh, working on that and is really doing a great job. He's got it just about wrapped up. One thing um, 
you know about DNS and and you, something you'll get out of other some other service registry and discover discovery service registry and discovery services that you don't get in the Kubernetes DNS based service discovery is uh, is push. So if you're sitting there, uh, you have you're using a headless service in Kubernetes, and uh, therefore the client the client side load balance and the client is aware of all the different IP addresses that a service resolves to. And that changes, you know, a pod goes away, a new pod comes in, whatever it may be. The client isn't informed of that with DNS. They have to go re-resolve the SRV record or whatever it is in order to see that. So um, we're looking at the possibility of creating a, a gRPC-based protocol there such that we can push changes down uh, to the uh, to the client side load balancers as they happen within Kubernetes. And as an adjunct to that, we'd have uh, the idea of a service registry API. So today, um, in the Kubernetes use case, Kubernetes itself is the registry, and uh, we just do the discovery side. But in other use cases where you're running etcd, or maybe you're running etcd in combination with uh, Kubernetes in order to handle some of these other records that I put in the files um, because you want them to be dynamic. Um, we would like to be able to register uh, through an API in Core DNS, and then depending on what backend you're using, dynamically we can write we can write it to that backend. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but multi-cluster service discovery without the federation control plane. So um, federation is really cool, but um, we've heard from people who don't necessarily want to run the federation control plane. It's sort of a step too far for them right now, but they have multiple clusters and they'd like to be able to resolve services between multiple clusters automatically. So we're looking at some solutions, uh, solutions to that. We're talking about building in our policy middleware as well as integrating it with, with the, uh, the open policy agent. Today, policy middleware is, um, is what we call an out of tree middleware. It, it, it's in a separate repository. And, um, We'd like to build that in as well as make some policy, simple policies directly uh, configurable within the core file that is the configuration file of Core DNS itself, while still enabling complex policies that live uh, essentially in a separate microservice that evaluates the policy. Um, and whatever the community needs, I mean, this is the core thing about Core DNS uh, is that it's extensible. It's easy to add these new features. It's easy to add backends. And we have community members who come along um, and just, you know, within a few days of, of looking at the code, add these backends to different systems that we don't even know about. Um, so it's, you know, it's, that level of extensibility is really, uh, really central to, to Core DNS. And, and so we're, we'd love to hear from the community about things that, uh, things that you need. And in order to get a hold of us to tell us about that, here's uh, the information. We ha have a, uh, a channel on the CNCF Slack, and we have a mailing list as well as uh, GitHub is always a great way to get a hold of us or uh, or Twitter even. And um, please take a look at our. I guess our blog doesn't show here, but if you go on the uh, the website, there's a link to the blog. A lot of the examples that I've given are explained in more detail in the blog. Um, and so you may want to take a look at those to get a better understanding of how those work. And uh, are there any other questions? Thanks, John. That was excellent. Um, I see there's still a bunch of people in the webinar. If you do have questions, uh, now is your time to pounce. Uh, in the meantime, I've got one. Um, is the intention that CoreDNS will become the default service discovery for Kubernetes? That's our intention. And we've been working with uh, the community on that. Um, this sort of major change will happen, you know, um, we'll take a bit of time. Um, we have to answer questions uh, like Justin had about, you know, how are we going to perform in different, um, different scale uh, clusters uh, at different levels of load. So we're working on evaluating those things. And we are, um, we've had several meetings with uh, the folks involved in currently maintaining KubeDNS and they're open to it. Uh, KubeDNS is based on SkyDNS, which, you know, uh, is, is um, as I said, the predecessor to Core DNS. It's, it shares a lot of the same code. Um, the the main DNS protocol code is the same. What's different is the the way that we 
interact with that code in a way we present that code and configure and everything that's we've simplified and, and made a lot more extensible. So they're definitely open to it. Um, but as I said, we are working on and on getting that uh, getting all our ducks in a row to make that map that viable. Thanks, John. Um, so there's no other questions come in. So I think we're going to call it a day. I want to thank everyone who uh, showed up to listen in. And of course, big thank you to you, John, for taking the time to explain um, this introduction to Core DNS. Uh, for now, that's it. If you do need to get in touch with John, there's many, many ways there. And if that doesn't work out, you can always contact the CNTF and we'll put you in touch somehow. Um, that's it. Goodbye for now. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Bye.